Howdy, my friends. Just going to get right into it today. 10 things you absolutely need to know before you start working with music libraries. Number one, there are hundreds of libraries out there between royalty free libraries and TV and production libraries. There's a lot of them. Not all of them are created equal. Some of them thrive over time. Others fizzle out and die. Certainly not all of them are going to be the right fit for your music. Some of them specialize in specific genres like trailer music, for example. Others have a really broad range of genres and styles. Some are owned by major record labels. Others are totally independent. It's really not difficult to find them. A quick Google search of music library databases will bring up some interesting results for you. Often you can find out where a TV show is sourcing their music from if they're working with the music library. You can figure it out if you just do a little digging online. Pretty much all of these libraries have websites and a lot of them have public catalogs which you can browse and listen to the music that's on the library. It's really important to do a little research and find out which libraries could potentially be a good fit for your music. I personally work closely with two royalty-free libraries called Motion Array and Artlist. The doors are always open to apply to both of those libraries. Many libraries have submission links and you know contact details listed right on the website. Before you do submit your music to them, I can't stress it enough, do some research, uh, study the library and get a, a sense for what they're looking for. Number two, there's several different streams of income for a library composer. So library composers like myself uh, make income in various different ways. So I earn monthly and annual payouts uh, from a revenue share model that's calculated by the amount of downloads that my tracks uh, receive on the libraries that I work with and these libraries charge their users an annual or monthly subscription fee uh, and I get a piece of that pie. I also earn revenue from content ID, uh, from performance royalty income, and from commission work. Many library composers also earn money from upfront sync fees. In the spirit of keeping this video uh, relatively short, uh, I'm going to avoid getting into uh, all the details about all of those streams of income. I will just say that there is plenty of opportunity to make money. I earn a full-time income from music. Like anything else in life. It just takes hard work and persistence, but if you're writing strong material, uh, you can absolutely get there. Number three, you don't have to work directly with music supervisors to get placed on TV or film. So a music supervisor is someone who oversees all music related aspects of a film, a television show, an advertising campaign, or a video game. Building and nurturing uh, relationships with music supervisors is certainly one way in which you can uh, find a path towards uh, syncing your music. And I can attest to this myself as someone who used to spend a lot of time going to networking events and uh, you know meeting music supervisors and pitching my music to them. And I was always in hopes of getting my band's music on uh, TV shows or film projects. And I actually did have some small uh, success with that. But the cool thing is, is that working with music libraries is effectively a way of kind of bypassing having to do all that. You don't have to go to networking events. You don't have to actually go and meet music supervisors in order to get uh, your music placed on television. Uh, working with a library alone can get you there. And I know many working composers who have an incredible list of placements simply from working with one or two music libraries. If you do have the time and you want to put the effort into building relationships with music supervisors, though, uh, by all means, go for it. Number four, music libraries are often run by small and dedicated teams. This is something that's super important to keep in mind if you're trying to apply to or if you're trying to reach out to uh, any library in any way. The exclusive you know, TV and production libraries especially um, are often run by very small teams and it, it might take a while for them uh, to get back to you on your application. So I think it's really important to you know, just be patient and it's also really important to just keep things personal. Uh, never send out any like copy pasted uh, spammy emails to these guys. You do that kind of thing and it's pretty much a guarantee that they will not get back to you. Again, I think it really speaks to the value of just doing a little bit of research uh, on a library before you reach out to them. Um, you know, find out who's behind the scenes and, and what kind of placements they're getting. And you know, if you approach them showing that you've done a little bit of research, I think that's going to go a long way. Number five, different types of libraries serve very different types of customers. So royalty free music libraries and TV in production uh, music libraries um, serve you know a very different type of customer with different needs generally speaking royalty free music libraries uh, are serving the uh, the content creators out there the youtubers the uh, social media influencers and also you know uh, indie filmmakers as well this is also where you might go if you're working on say like a small budget advertising campaign production music libraries on the other hand often have relationships with broadcasting networks and they might provide cues for anything from you know reality tv to sports coverage these days i think there's a, a bit more crossover um, 
um, more and more I'm hearing about music supervisors for for TV shows um, going to the royalty free market to source their their tracks. And I've certainly had many stock music composer friends, uh, you know, tell me that their cues have landed on TV shows and generated performance royalty income for them. Number six, you don't need a huge amount of music to get started on music libraries. This is a common misconception, I think, about working with, uh, you know, music libraries, but I think it sort of depends on what your strategy is. If you want to pitch to production libraries, then I think it's, you know, probably best to pitch like an album of music, maybe seven to 12 tracks in a singular genre. I think that's a great way to make like, you know, a strong statement and a, and a good first impression. Uh, however, uh, not all libraries need to hear um, like a whole album's worth of music. If you want to start out with the royalty free market, uh, you can certainly get set up on a library with just one or two tracks. That of course depends on which library uh, you're applying to, but I know that for example, Artlist uh, actually prefers smaller submissions uh, and you know are happy to listen to like a three to five track submission. I think in the end, it's probably just easier for them to market a smaller package of songs. Number seven, not all music library contracts are the same. This is something to be acutely aware of um, contracts differ uh, in the sense that they can be exclusive, they can be non-exclusive. Um, some of the exclusive contracts can be pretty restrictive. Many production libraries will insist that they hold your music in their catalog in perpetuity uh, or otherwise often at least for a set number of years before giving you the option to remove it if you choose to do so. Many production libraries will also act as your publisher, uh, so they will register your music with a performance rights organization and they'll collect their share of the revenue from the publisher side while you collect uh, the writer's share. That's a pretty standard deal. Other libraries do like complete buyouts, like work for hire contracts where you uh, essentially give up the rights to your master recording in exchange for a set fee. Other contracts are totally non-exclusive and you can use that same music anywhere else. You can sell it on other libraries, you can upload it to Spotify, you can do whatever you want with it. As with all things, it's just really important to read a contract very carefully uh, and get some advice um, if you're not sure about it. Make sure you understand the terms very well uh, before um, you get yourself into anything that you might regret. Not all contracts are the same and certainly there are some out there that are uh, maybe a little bit on the shady side. So you got to keep an eye out. Number eight, royalty free music libraries uh, are a great place to start your journey in music licensing. In my opinion, if you are totally new to this, uh, you're feeling overwhelmed and uh, you know just not sure where to start, I always recommend you know just starting on Pond5. I think it's a great training ground for music licensing. Uh, you, you might not see any immediate sales there, uh, but their doors are always open uh, to submissions. They very often accept whatever you send to them, um, and it's relatively easy to get set up with them. And while you're getting a sense for, you know, what it takes to, uh, you know, tag your tracks and write descriptions and, uh, and all that stuff that comes with the territory, uh, you might make a few bucks. And, you know, I certainly make a few sales every now and then on Pond5 still, and these are for tracks that I uploaded ages ago. Uh, and every month or two, I get a nice little bonus from them. It's cool. It's one of the OG royalty-free libraries. It's been around for a long time, and I still maintain that it's a, a solid place to kind of start your journey with music licensing and just, you know, start building some momentum. Number nine, there's demand for all types of music. To be completely fair, there are certain genres which are more licensable. Uh, for example, hip-hop, um, rock, corporate, cinematic, uh, electronic, orchestral, and trailer music. Uh, you know, these are genres that are always going to do well in the uh, licensing space. But there is room for all kinds of music on libraries. And I guarantee that if you just browse through some of the uh, public catalogs on music libraries, you'll, you'll see that firsthand. Number 10, you don't have to have a fan base. This has got to be maybe the single best part about working with music libraries. Uh, you don't have to be famous or, or have a, you know, a big social media following um, to do well in the music licensing space. All that matters really is that you're writing really strong material. If you're writing great music, it will find its way. Also, another great thing about music licensing is that it can actually grow your artist profile if that's something that you're inclined to do. And in fact, many successful artists have kickstarted their whole career as a result of a key placement in a film or a television show. I've personally benefited hugely from my exposure on Artlist, uh, and that's translated into uh, streaming income as well from Spotify. But the thing to remember is that you don't need to be a rock star to do well on music libraries. Uh, you just need to send them great music and that's all they really care about. 
at the end of the day, they don't care about how many TikTok or Instagram followers you have. All right, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I appreciate it. If you want to learn about how to write music that's going to thrive on music libraries, then please go to productionmusicacademy.com. Uh, I'll put that link in the description below. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Uh, appreciate you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.